an expanse of green pulls on the horizon. We are in Shizuoka Prefecture, the heartland of Japanese tea. Shizuoka Prefecture produces 40% of the nation's entire harvest of green tea, a drink enjoyed by many abroad for its rich fragrance. Tea has given us an essential theme in haiku, and its greatest poet, Matsuo Basho, has left a verse from his travels here. Road to Suruga, fragrant orange blossoms, complete with the scent of tea. Basho must have marveled at how tea's bracing scent could pierce through the strong fragrance of orange blossoms. Stone markers engraved with his poems are everywhere. This fresh young greenery is so beautiful. This is the season just for appreciating the various shades and variations of green. Our first stop is a museum encircled by tea fields. This museum, opened in 2018, centers on the theme of tea from around the world. Japan, China, Turkey, etc. It calls attention to various manufacturing processes and original teas. Surrounded by the charm of tea, this is the perfect place to savor photo haiku. What a perfect setting for a tea party. <laughs> yes, it is. Let's enjoy some, shall we? Mm. Oh, there's nothing like tea in its home. What a wonderful fragrance. And it's full of the flavor of fresh new tea. It's marvelous. What better place to enjoy the works that people have sent to us from around the world? Absolutely the best. Yeah. Welcome to the world of photo haiku, the bringing together of image and poem. Each work must follow three rules. It has to be a three-line haiku. It has to portray seasonality. And it has to maintain a balance, fusoku furi. Picture and poem can be neither too close nor too far apart. Now, on to our selection of the best works sent in from all over the world. Voiceless gulls, the sky resonates, flapping wings. No seagulls are visible in the photo, so perhaps the author hears them flapping their wings somewhere close by. We do see the sky, though, and it's dyed in the colors of sunset, indicating the summer, when the sunsets are so beautiful. So it is, mm. Exactly. That's a, an established kigo, isn't mm. it? Sunset, because it happens so late in the day. Mm. Summer days seem to go on mm. forever, don't mm. they? Mm. We can see the sunset any time of the year, but the fact that it's become a season word for summer suggests several things. People are out longer on summer evenings, and so are more likely to be struck by the beauty of the sunset in that season. They can see the sky changing, becoming dyed in an even deeper crimson hue. And seagulls, though typically wheeling and crying overhead, are silent today. But to say that the gulls are silent, ironically, makes you hear them inside your head, doesn't it? <laughs> That's a sneaky way of getting the gull's voice in there without having the gull's voice in there. It's interesting. The old train station, only from the swallow nest, departures and arrivals. Swallows actually like stations, don't they? You often see them building their nests there. In this work, it appears to be a deserted station, one that's fallen into disuse. In an abandoned station, only the swallows would come and go, arrive or depart. I find the photo very tasteful. The stopwatch could have been carried by a station master in the station's heyday. And the fact that it's a watch suggests the passage of time, a long period of time. 
It's interesting because the old train station by itself doesn't necessarily mean a train station that isn't in use anymore, but only, the word only here carries a lot of load because it means that the trains are not coming. Only the swallows are coming back and forth, departing and arriving. But it made me think of how if we leave a building, even for a short amount of time, nature reabsorbs it, comes around again, and the, the birds take over and the trees grow around it. So I, I rather loved that, that, that idea. Except there's no mention of crows or sparrows, only swallows coming and going, because there's a nest there and the swallows are rearing their babies. In that sense, the work suggests a bright future on the horizon. Exactly. Thunderstorms, warm rum, caressing my tongue. This appeals to the senses in so many ways. First, a thunderstorm and its torrential rains, all happening just beyond the thin barrier of a single window pane. Inside, however, there's warm rum to drink. It bathes the tongue gently, and I can start to taste the rum and savor its rich, heady aroma. Oh my, I'm starting to feel a little tipsy here. I, I, I agree. I like the way thunderstorms, which kind of vibrates inside you, matches with rum. I don't drink a lot of rum, so I don't really know, but rum, I think, also kind of vibrates, resonates, reverberates inside you. Caressing my tongue is almost a, a silky, sensual uh, addition, though. And it made me think of how, with shelter and uh, enough time, we can really enjoy any aspect of nature. And how lucky for this person. Basho, for example, would have been stuck in the thunderstorm and soaked to the bone, probably. But this guy, this man, has the chance to sit back and just enjoy. He certainly seems to be in the lap of luxury here. Warm rum caressing the tongue, savoring its taste and aroma. Then awed by the curtain of rain and stabs of lightning. And naturally, he would also hear the splitting crack of thunder. Managing to stimulate all five senses in language so simple and in so few words, it makes this a remarkable work. Tea production began in Shizuoka during the 13th century, when a Buddhist high priest brought seeds back from China and planted them. Tea was regarded as a valuable export to bring in much needed foreign capital. These fields have become one of Japan's greatest tea plantations. Shizuoka's tea, which began as a commodity for export, is still being enjoyed by people the world over. We talked with an industry representative, Mr. Shida, about the overseas expansion of these beverages. This entire hillside is tea. What makes Shizuoka such a good place to cultivate tea? It's good for tea cultivation here because the climate is warm. There are many fields in the valleys and there is a good temperature difference between morning cool and evening warmth. Tea has been exported ever since the port in Yokohama opened in 1859. And people on the east coast of America, in particular, love to drink it. Japanese tea has been popular throughout the world for many years, and still it's finding new markets. Green tea is consumed in Silicon Valley because it has a healthy image of containing theanine and catechin. It's known as a good source of antioxidants. It's clean and refreshing. One can feel that. Recently, people say it's excellent support for creative work. For our part, we're very gratified to find the drink that we enjoy as a normal part of our daily life 
being appreciated now by people on the cutting edge of IT. Water over ice and tea leaves in a pot. This makes daicha, cold tea, perfect for the season. Brewing the tea at a lower temperature cuts down the bitterness. Such a beautiful color. We stir as it brews, watching the color. It's cold to the touch, too. Not at all bitter. No. I can really see how the color comes from the tea. The poet Isa has a verse that goes, the scent of new tea and a midday languor vanishes. The poem describes how the aroma of tea can banish noontime sleepiness. It prompts us to imagine how people during the Edo period could savor the aroma of new tea and afterward feel awake and refreshed to work through the afternoon. We're awaiting your haiku verse-only entries without accompanying photos. The theme of the haiku is tea. We'll be presenting images of tea from a variety of countries. Overcast day. I ask grandma to read the leaves. In Japan, we say that it's good luck if a tea stem floats standing up when you brew a cup of tea. You get the sense that something good is going to happen. But reading tea leaves seems to be more for black tea. I find the verse very subtle and tasteful because it doesn't tell us the result of the reading. The poem leads us to imagine what future the leaves are predicting. Wintry night, offering ginger tea for my grandpa. Winter nights are, of course, very cold. The person is making the tea, not for himself, but for his grandfather. So you can just see in your mind's eye the joy and affection in the grandfather's face. I find this to be a very heartwarming verse. Morning dew, among the slopes of the mountain, the tea pickers. Tea leaves are gathered before the dew has evaporated, during the morning hours. The air in the mountains in early morning is very clear. It's cool and bracing. That comes through in the verse. I also get a kind of mystical feeling. We asked for submissions of poetry based on the theme of tea, and I was struck by all the variations in the treatment. Not only were there poems on the joy of drinking tea, the setting or the feelings it evokes, but we also got verses on tea picking and even the feeling one gets after drinking a cup of tea. Summer rain. I hear all his words, except the last. Because it's a summer rain, the sound of the pelting is fierce. And the sounds of the man's voice that she hears are suggested by the rain, a memory. She's not actually hearing him speak in this moment. And then the final line, except the last, provides a surprise twist at the end. Very skillful, I thought. Oh, I totally agree. And of course, in, in the summer, the rain can be torrential, actually, a, a sudden downpour. 
and it can actually erase the sound of words if they're spoken very softly. So I thought this was actually happening as the rain was approaching, and you can hear the rain coming towards you, and it might erase that last word, but what was that last word? I love you. Mm. I love another. Mm. I, we don't Goodbye. know. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> the verse reflects the actual experience of the writer. At this moment, all she can really hear is the rain, while in her mind, she's replaying the past conversation where she hears his every word. The poem works on many levels. Summer evening. Some of our family debates already lost in time. For me, the summer evening is kind of, um, it's almost like a rich whiskey in color. Mm. People gathering around, the sun has gone down, and families uh, have their talks, debates, fights, feuds mm. sometimes. When a whole family gas gathers together in the summer, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. But I love the fact that this is already lost in time. Summer vacation is long. So this is the scene of a family gathering. Ah, uh, yes, yes. The photographs are of the father and grandfather, perhaps? I, I don't know, actually. There, there's a lot of mystery in this photograph. Look at the wall, too. I, I'm not sure, where is that wall? It's, it's all kind of bumpy and it has a strange surface to it. Maybe it's kind of cave-like, and that keeps you away from the heat of the summer? I don't know. Hmm, that's interesting. Perhaps the photograph is meant to make you wonder just what it is. Mm. Heavy summer heat. Along the high wall. Track of a snail. The word heavy really brings out the hot, sticky heat we feel during the rainy season here in Japan. Hard to breathe, right? Yeah. <laughs> it communicates just how unbearable the season is. So I see a snail here and I think, okay, there's no Fusoko Furi, but then I realize it's the track of the snail, the trace that it's left, the little glistening path on the high wall. And if the snail is smart, he's gone down to where it's a little bit cooler, looking for a place in the shade so that he doesn't die. But also he's carrying his heavy home with him. We never think of a snail's job or its hardship or anything, but when I looked at this, I thought, you know, everybody has a load, a burden to carry. The trail that a snail leaves glistens, and it's like a pretty silver path, you know? I can appreciate the artfulness in the photograph, how it expands your imagination to what isn't there in the picture. <laughs> Normally, we don't think of snails or slugs as beautiful. Or in Japanese haiku, at least, we don't think of such things as appropriate. Here, however, we find a snail pictured so beautifully, with so much charm, it expands the range of fit subjects for poetry, which is a good thing, I think. I think so too, exactly. First raindrops, an unexpected host at dinner time. Ebb tide, the gentle sound of her thoughts. I picked up a stone and threw it into a pond. Never knew that stone. Here, we have a bridge that played an important role in the development of Shizuoka's tea industry. It's known as Horai Bridge. It's so nice here. And look at the different colors, now. it's so pretty. 
The river Oi flows through the tea fields, and Horai Bridge was the first to span it. At a length of 897.4 meters, it boasts the distinction of being the longest wooden bridge in the world. It was over this very bridge, completed in 1879, that the tea picked locally was carried to the rest of the world. Before the bridge existed, this part of the river was regarded as a treacherous crossing due to both the sheer width of the river and its powerful current. Ferries were forbidden on the river, so people had to wade across. On one of his own travels there, Basho was unable to ford the river Oi and later wrote a haiku about it. Summer rains blow the very sky down straight into Oi River. In his poem, Basho is ordering the Oi River to literally blow the sky down. <laughs> What makes this such a splendid poem is the vigor of the language, the power of the words. It's like Basho is invoking the gods of the river Oi and of the land. Absolutely, I agree. And we have Basho to thank for the clear sky, as if it really has been blown down. It's said that he made his last journey to the West at age 51. Well, he, was, he really had a challenging spirit to go out into the wild mm. at that age. Sure. Traveling to a new land, you encounter a new climate with different customs and a different history. Everything is fresh. This stirs the poetic instincts. Mm -hmm. Was it like that, baby blue morning sky, when you left? This photograph is so completely routine. There's nothing especially beautiful about the scene. Just a snapshot, right? Mm. And yet, when taken together with the poem, you feel a living, breathing presence. Yes, absolutely. I thought the expression baby blue was very attractive. Would this be a kind of pure blue? Yes, and kind of innocent. Mm -hmm. Innocent. Innocent, that's right. Yeah. In the line, when you left, the you could refer to the sun, I thought. I imagined it was describing the day that he had left home to go out on his own. I, I think it seems to me that it, it calls to mind a child leaving mm. home. Mm. We say when a child leaves the home that they mm. leave the nest. Mm. We, uh, use wor mm. we use words that describe a bird situation, actually. Mm. So you have two birds here and a baby blue sky and somebody leaving, so it sounds to me like you might be right. Mm. It might be a child. Mm. It might be. I think the reason we see it that way is because there are birds here. Doves are a symbol of peace, aren't they? A new phase of life is beginning for the parent and the child who is leaving home. That's what it makes me picture. And the last line is very telling. The fact that so many interpretations are possible depending on the poet is one great thing about haiku. Glorious sunset. Ahead of the alley, not been selected. The phrase glorious sunset indicates a magnificent, gorgeous sunset. Is that right? More than just beautiful. Dazzling, yes? Absolutely. Almost heavenly. Mm. Mm. So it's far beyond beautiful. Something out there is so glorious, so sublime, yes? In that case, I wonder if it doesn't contain a feeling of regret for not having taken that path. 
it's, I think so too, yes. Mm. That happens in life. <laughs> the road not taken always comes back to haunt. On the surface, it describes a first trip somewhere, perhaps to a place like Venice. The traveler is wondering which way to go, whether or not to take a certain road. And from that situation, we expand the notion to include paths taken in life. That's what makes this work so interesting. Exactly. Now, let us choose our haiku master from the works we've presented. The old train station, only from the swallow nest, departures and arrivals. I thought this work was extremely well done. In choosing a haiku, we put great weight on the seasonality. But life has its seasons too. We're born, fall in love, get married, have children, all these different seasons in our lives. If we don't experience them, we could never produce a work like this. That's how it made me feel. This time, we took in lots of charming works from various countries. We always encourage our haiku poets to make works that appeal to the five senses. And it strikes me that, in this episode, our own experiences have also been filled with multiple sensations. Lovely the way that worked out. I have, a, by walking outside in this beautiful scenery, a lot of material for good ones. I think crossing the Horai Bashi also was an extremely powerful experience. And uh, that plus green tea, and I think we're going to live to 100. <laughs> <laughs> so let's stay healthy. <laughs> and we've satisfied all five senses.